it in the movie. In spite of that, his aunt, Peter Parker's aunt had wanted him to meet this girl, Mary Jane. For the longest time, she was the daughter of a next door neighbor or something. And the aunt would always say to Peter, she's such a nice girl, you should meet her. Well, all you gotta do is say to a teenage boy, I want you to meet a nice girl and he'll run for the hills. So Peter tried never to meet her. Finally, in one story, at the end of one story, he opens up the door and there she is standing in the doorway and she is a knockout. And she has the line, Face it, tiger, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> and I love that line, and I'm so sorry they didn't use it in the first movie. But in the fourth movie, they're going back to him as a teenager. I have a hunch they're going to use it in that movie. So remember, you heard it here first. <laughs> I've heard you quoted a couple times, including in the Marvel Masterworks, Daredevil, the first collection of Daredevil Marvel Masterworks. You cited the battle between Daredevil and the Submariner as one of your all-time favorite stories. Uh, along with the Face of Tiger, you hit the Jackpot story. Can you cite any others that are that you know you you hold dear as some of your your favorites? Well. I loved them all. I loved the Silver Surfer stories. There was one, and then the Silver Surfer was one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. And you got the, you know, you could really, you know, it's kind of prophetic or, you know, wax eloquent. You get to be a little more poetic with that strip than you got to with others. In the Silver Surfer, I used to have him, I tried to make him comment on the human condition from the point of view of an outsider, like, He'd be cruising around on his surfboard and he'd say, what's the matter with the human race? They, they have this beautiful planet, beautiful weather, and all the food they could want growing out. They have oceans and land, and, and yet they fight, and they have war, and they hate each other, and they have crime. Are they insane? Why don't they appreciate? You know, and all the little philosophical, corny things that I always think of, I was able to bring out of the mouth of the silver surface, so I liked him. And I had him talk in kind of a semi-Shakespearean, biblical, phraseology kind of way. One story I remember that I liked, it was a daredevil story, and there was, it's hard for me to remember it, there was a black fellow who had been a solar cop, and either he got blinded in the line of duty as a cop, as an officer, or he was in the army, and he got blinded in the army, I forget. But he comes back, and he's unhappy, he's almost suicidal. What will he do as a blind man? And Daredevil, oh, and somebody wants to kill him. And Daredevil pretends, it, it was a complicated thing, but the, the two assassins who want to kill the blind man attack him. They don't know Daredevil is there. Daredevil fights and defeats them in such a way that they think the blind man had done it. And now, by God, nobody's ever going to pick on that blind guy again. And also, he gave the blind man a new reason for wanting to live that day. I thought that was one of the most emotional stories I had ever written. I, I got to find it someday. I just thought of it now. No, there, there was, yeah. we'll, we'll talk. We'll some talk about this uh, panel connection with uh, history of Marvel and both well, Captain America. And I think that one of the most interesting things about Captain America in all the many, many decades that he's been around was that you brought him back in the '60s. The idea that he had to deal with being a man that felt like he was out of his time, that he really didn't belong in the 60s. He was a man from the 40s and, and having to kind of live to adapt. And, and that was compounded by uh, a new girlfriend that reminded him of his old girlfriend. Do I really love her or am I just remin reminiscing of my old girlfriend? So uh, those are things that are a little bit beyond what we would, a lot of people would expect out of the comic. A little more literary, a little more depth. Well, I tr and also I tried to make it he felt he was an anachronism. He was somebody from the past. And yet he had to adjust to living in the modern age 
when things were a little different. Now there were hippies and there was rock music and stuff like that, which hadn't existed. So what I was trying to do, unfortunately, Captain America had always been a two-dimensional character. He was just a strong, nice guy who fought bad guys. But there was nothing much about him. I just tried to give him a little, a little more depth, that was all. And it that was fun writing him. You, you accomplished that. Okay, I think we're going to wind up pretty soon, pretty quickly. The young man with the top. Um, I'm not sure that was the script you wrote. Gene Gray first turning into the Phoenix? Which Gene Gray and the X-Man turning into the Phoenix? No, I didn't write that. Yeah. I, I think that was Len Wein or one of those guys. Even Chris yeah. Claremont. Here are the, the, uh, the baseball caps. Yeah, uh, do you have any say on who gets to play oh, for the characters in the movies, or is that for the audio hands to hide about that? Casting. You have any input at all in casting on the movies? No, I don't. I'd like to, but I don't. <laughs> I actually have nothing to do with the movies. I'll talk to some of the people, the director or some actor, before the movie starts, just socially, you know, for a little while. But then I have nothing to do with it uh, until I do my cameo. And even then, I have nothing to do with it. I come to this place, I do my cameo, and I get the hell off. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Stan, I want to thank the Rockin' Comic Con for giving us this unique, intimate way to visit with Stan.